Good morning. Good morning, Dale. Wow, today, just uh, so you know where we're going, we're going to be introduced to Paul. I'm sorry, Saul. His name is still Saul. His name is going to be Saul for several years yet, as far as we know. Contrary to popular belief, he may not have undergone a conversion on the road to Damascus. We'll look at that today. He didn't change his name because of his conversion on the road to Damascus, but that's what is most popularly taught, so it's okay if we look at that. Um, and so that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about Saul. Before we get there, though, I had this picture I wanted to show you. Um, in Israel, they took this of three of the gals that are in the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, the army. The girl on the right is a Christian. She's wearing a cross. The girl in the middle is, Israel, is a Jewish, Israelite. And the girl on the left is Muslim. And they're all fighting for decency and peace. fighting against chaos and everything that's wrong in the world and trying to restore that in Israel. And that just blesses me when I see that come together. And I think we see that in the prophecy in the Bible that in the end times, every man will take hold of the coat of a Jew, which I think they're talking about Jesus, and say, show us the way, show us the way to peace. And the angels, this, the Advent candle this week is peace. And this week in Israel, Friday night, they lit the first of the Hanukkah candles. And Hanukkah is, Jesus was in Jerusalem during the Feast of Dedication, which is Hanukkah. And he's walking through Jerusalem and he would have seen all these menorahs in the windows. Um, everybody lit their Hanukkah candles for, um, for eight days. Because when the... Uh, and Antiochus Epiphanes, the Syrian, came in and destroyed their temple, sacrificed a pig on their altar. Um, they went to war, 10,000 or so Jewish fighters against 50,000 um, Syrians. They had big tanks. Well, actually, they were elephants. Um, and th they fought, uh, and they won. And when they came back to clean up their temple... Um, they didn't know what to do with the stones of the altar. They're holy, so you can't get rid of them, but they're unclean because they have pig blood on them. So they decided to place them in the portico of Solomon, and when Messiah comes, he would tell us what they should do with those stones. Isn't it interesting that Jesus often was in the portico of Solomon, and after his resurrection, the disciples were often teaching in the portico of Solomon. And I often wondered... The place was immaculate, marble, gold, everything. And I often wonder if um, when they tried to stone him, Jesus, they picked up stones to stone him if they took him from that, uh, from those piles uh, of that. But they're celebrating Hanukkah now, today in Israel. They're celebrating the fact that on, they took back over the temple, they cleansed it, and they had no oil to light the lamp. There's only a little bit, they have one small vial of oil that would only be good for maybe a day. But they went ahead and put it in and they lit it. And before, it took eight days before they could get more oil and it burned for all eight days. And so that's where they come up with the eight days of Hanukkah. They saw uh, a miracle of God in those days. And so in the midst of Hanukkah this year, they're fighting the terrorists in Gaza. Many hostages still being held, still being abused. Uh, on a lighter note, uh, this is my son-in-law, Lucas, in Cambodia. We're going to be going there in January. And he's doing water projects. Uh, that's the color of the PVC pipe in Cambodia. And that's his mode of transportation. So that's how he gets his equipment to and from the water projects. My daughter uh, uh, often is teaching English classes in Cambodia. And our grandson, Benjamin, is... Uh, entertaining the children in the neighborhood. <laughs> um, so anyway, let's hop in. If you will go to uh, Acts chapter 9, we're going to cover 31 verses today. And in way of review, you remember that St 
Paul was holding the jackets of the, peop- the witnesses that stoned Stephen. And that implies more participation than just an observer. Perhaps he was even one of the ones in the trial, one of the ones convicting Stephen, one of the ones that tore his clothing and said stone him, and they took off their outer garments, and Saul held them, and then they stoned Stephen. After that, persecution started in Jerusalem. Philip left. He went to Samaria, um, and back in uh, Jerusalem, they're still trying to pass laws to exclude the Gentiles. Anyone but Jews are not included in God's kingdom. The leadership is. Peter has to make these decisions about who's in and who's out. And so far, it's, we're, we're four years into post-resurrection, and we, all we have is Jewish disciples at this point. And so Philip goes down to Samaria, the, the most unclean of unclean, the Jewish people next to Gentiles, and they come to Christ. And so word goes to Peter, and he's got to go down and go, man, if, I, if, the, if, the, Gentile, if the Samaritans are in, this is... There are going to be a lot of people mad at me back in Jerusalem because the Gentiles are hated. And lo and behold, they're baptized and the gift of the, the Holy Spirit falls upon them and they receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit as a sign that God has included them. Okay, So it's important to remember right now that a huge portion of Samaria has come to Christ. They are also Jewish people. They were from the other ten tribes, intermarried with other parts of the world, but still speaking Hebrew, still practicing, uh, enjoying their, their time, uh, worshiping God on their own mountain, Mount Gerizim. And remember, Jesus goes to the Samaritan woman and says, she says, this is the place to worship, right? Or is it Jerusalem? And he says, there's a time coming when you won't worship in either place, but you're going to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And this is the time... Um, has come, and the Samaritans recognize it, and they recognize the Jewish Messiah. Now, we'll just leave it there, because we're going to come back to Samaria at the end, because a self-proclaimed prophet in Samaria says, kind of trying to be a Messiah, says, if you will all join me on Mount Gerizim, I will show you where the Ark of the Covenant is hidden, and I will show you all the temple valuables that were hidden when Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians destroyed um, the temple. And that's going to take place pretty quick, and so we're just going to leave it right there. Do you think these Samaritan Christians are going to go and be part of that, or do you think they're going to say, I don't want any part of that? Okay, that's, that happens in 35 CE, sometime in the next year or so. All right, so Saul. Who is Saul then? Saul was... Um, He was, he was the Jewish, the young prodigy. He was like Gamaliel's star student. He was, he tells us in other scriptures, he talks about himself uh, in Galatians 1, in Acts 22, Acts 29, 1 Corinthians 15, and Galatians 4. And you bring all those scriptures together, you get the whole story of Paul. But we're going to stay in Acts uh, chapter 9 today, and I'll just kind of fill you in as we go. But he says that, he says, I excelled all the other students. I was the rising star in Judaism. The problem is, he was a ra- his rabbi was Gamaliel, the grandson of Hillel, who was more of a peace lover. And remember when the disciples were on trial and Gamaliel said, if this is of the Lord, you're not going to stop it. And if it's not of the Lord, it's going to disappear. And so they let the disciples go. That was not Saul's position. Saul is obviously getting letters from the high priest and the, and the, Sanhed, and the, and the Sadducees to go and arrest people who are of the way. Now, do you see a conflict there between him and his rabbi? I wake up in the middle of the night, and I, I don't know if I should use this analogy, but I'm going to. This is a little bit like Darth Vader. (laughs) You know, the emperor is evil, and Darth Vader was a Jedi Knight on the good side, and then he turned to the evil side. 
And then the emperor sent Darth Vader to wipe out the resistance. And, and that's kind of what we're... Do you know how long it took me to find a picture? Saul would be about 30... I think he was born in five. He's just, just turned 30. He's just ready to get going. 30 is the, is the age you start doing things as, as a, after being a disciple. And so he's about 30 in this picture. He's the star. He's the Darth Vader of the empire. And he's to go and wipe out the resistance. And, he's, and, and he, he gets letters to go to the planet Damascus. So where they're, you know, while they build the starship in Israel. I don't know. I don't want to go too far with the analogy, okay? But anyway, if we pick up in verse 1, it says, Now Saul was still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And he went to the high priest. A Pharisee probably wouldn't even do that. And asked for letters for him. And, and Paul calls himself a Pharisee. Even years later, he still says, I am a Pharisee. It's just at this point, he had kind of switched sides. And... Uh, he got letters uh, from him to go to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them to Jerusalem. Uh, the way. They, that nickname was starting to be used of Jewish believers who recognized the Jewish Messiah that the Old Testament had prophesied. They recognized that Jewish Messiah did come and he said... He is the way, the truth, and the life. And so they borrowed that phrase, the way. He was, represents the narrow way. He represents the way to God. And I think you remember that time I told you that story, and I won't go into it again, but I was having a discussion with a uh, religious Jew in Israel, and I just asked him, I said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What do you think about that? And he said, well... We have that same saying, the way, the truth, and the life, but it applies to the Old Testament scriptures. The scriptures are the way to God. The word of God is the way to God. And I wish I would have thought and said, yeah, that's why John called him the word. He fulfilled the way, the truth, and the life. And you can't come to God unless you come through Jesus, the word. And so they called him the way. And... Um, they sent him to Damascus. Now, Damascus, uh, I've been really close to Damascus. I've been up to the fence that is the border between Israel and Lebanon. And if you could see up over that hill, there's the city of Damascus. But I didn't go. I didn't, they wouldn't let me through that fence, nor did I want to go, because it's in modern day. I said Lebanon. It might be Syria. Now I'm in trouble, aren't I? I think it's Lebanon. But... Um, Israel has, uh, has to have a fence on their northern border, and they have to have a fence all along the Jordan River, and they have to have a fence all along the Egypt uh, Sinai Peninsula, and it has to have cameras and this mile of desert between it so you can see people coming. And it's this fence that Hamas a, a month ago, a couple months ago, however long it's been, um, crossed that empty zone and flew over it with paragliders and cut through it and raided in the, in the villages. So this is Israel. Uh, if you see Gaza down below and then you take the, the highway up uh, through um, Hatzor is just the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And you go through Hatzor, Hazor we call it, and you get to Damascus. And that's the road that Paul is probably on when all this takes place, it's about 135 miles. Okay, so they're going. I don't know if they got camels, horses, carts, how they're getting there, but Saul is anxious to get there because he's, he says in Galatians that he was zealous um, to, per, to preserve the ways, the traditions of God. And, you, and many people are very zealous about what they do. We talked last week about the Crusaders. They were very zealous about their trip to the Holy Land to wipe out Jews and Muslims and reclaim it for Christians. It doesn't always make, mean you're right. And I think Paul was more or less sincere, but he had definitely turned to the dark side. And he was going after the Christians in Damascus. That's a long ways away. And I think it's because a lot, of a lot of them had fled to Damascus. There was a large Jewish group up there, about 10,000 Jewish people. 
And so that would be a lot of synagogues spread around Damascus and in that area. Damascus was one of the um, Decapolis cities, one of the ten Gentile cities. So Saul goes, he takes this road up, and on the way, some bright lights from heaven. I actually took that, that's my wife in the picture in Jerusalem, but for some reason the light was shining through, and I just love that because that's, that's where, where does the light come from? And so Saul, he saw a bright light. Let's look at that. Let's keep going. And it came about um, that as he journeyed, as he approached Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground. And heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and it shall be told to you what you must do. So, God met Saul on the road, didn't he? In a miraculous, super way. And we all have different stories of how we encounter God. And some of them involve light and God speaking to us and powerful ways. And I'm convinced that everybody here has had that personal experience. But in this case, um, God got the attention of Saul. Darth Vader didn't make it very far. But now the resistance movement is nervous about him. Is he, is he for real or is he faking it? You know, And so... Um, he saw light, he heard the voice of God, he questioned in his heart who this was, and, and um, God said, why are, you, why are you persecuting me? Well, was Saul persecuting Jesus? He was persecuting the disciples, his believers. But didn't Jesus say, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you. Which is very interesting because it's still true today, isn't it? They persecuted him, they'll persecute us. And so he says, why are you persecuting me? And why do you kick against the goad? Do you know what a goad is? Not a goat. A goad. In those days, if you were um, had a team of oxen and you wanted them to turn left, you'd tell them, and if they didn't, you'd, you had this long stick with this sharp little end on it called an ox goad, and you'd poke that ox a little bit, and he'd get, you'd get his attention. Well, the rabbis called the word of God a goad. The word of God was going to goad you in the direction that God wants you to go. And Jesus uses this analogy and says, and, and so, if the ox didn't like it, he could kick at it. Get that thing away from me. But the ox driver would poke again and poke again and poke again until the ox would go the direction he wanted. And, and, he, and Jesus said, why are you kicking against the goad? I have been trying to get your... T-. Makes me think that this has been going on for a while. Paul heard Stephen's defense. Paul s- heard the story of the Messiah. And Stephen was great and mighty in spirit. And Paul kicked that goad away probably time and time again, and now he's looking for people of the way to arrest and drag back and flog and kill. So he's, why, why are you kicking against the goad? And, um, but he says, but rise uh, and enter the city, and it shall be told you what to do. And the men who traveled with him uh, stood speechless. Now this uh, stands there today. This is the archway to the street called Straight. And in these ancient cities, they had a... a a main street called the Cardo, Cardo Maximus, and they had another one that intersected it, and those were like your two main streets, kind of like 211 and 213. And so go to the street called Straight. Now that would have been a town of maybe 50, 100,000 people. Okay, go to the street called Straight, <laughs> and I will tell you what to do. This, we'll, we'll, we'll get to this in a little bit, because that's what Ananias is told. And he traveled with him. Um, let's see. And Saul uh, got up from the ground, entered the city. And he was there how many days? Three days. Three days without sight. Remember we did this story with the kids in daily vacation Bible school this year? 
We had all the kids close their eyes and try to walk around to simulate being blind and simulate being Saul. Um, and then this man named Ananias uh, came and, uh, and, and prayed over Saul. And it, it was a lot of fun. The kids were fun. Now, there was a certain disciple at Damascus um, named Ananias. And the Lord said to him uh, in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Now, notice it called him a disciple. So already we have disciples in Damascus, all over the world. Uh, and he said, Behold, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for a man from Tarsus. Now, we read these Bible stories and we think there's, it's a little town with like nine houses, right? So you go to the straight of street and find Judas. This is a huge city. So he must have had some other help finding this house. Anyway, go to the house of Judas uh, for a man from Tarsus there named Saul. So God is still calling him Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias will come in and lay his hands on him that he might regain his sight. And Ananias said, sure, Lord, I'm in. Uh-uh. This is like being told to go and pray over Darth Vader. It has got to be a trap, Right? You're part of the resistance, and he's here to get you, and you, you know, you, Princess Leia comes in the pictogram off of R2-D2 and tells you to go. I'm, I'm taking it too far, I know. But you get the idea. Ananias, I mean, normally you don't argue with God in a vision, right? You get this vision, and God says, go. And you go, I think I better. But Ananias says, Lord, I don't really want to do this. I kind of like him being blind. Kind of sounds like Jonah, doesn't it? The Ninevites are wicked. Lord, I don't want them to be part of your kingdom. And Ananias is saying, we're doing pretty good here in Damascus. We got this nice little community. We got our own nice little synagogue here. It's mostly believers. We have potlucks. And, you know, the women make quilts and, uh, you know, all of that. And, and you want me to go? And, and I'm not so sure. So anyway... Um, he, and I says, Lord, I have heard from many that this man, how much harm he did to the, to the saints at Jerusalem. If I'm not mistaken, I think this is the first time the word saints is used for Christians. It's an Old Testament term for people who diligently and with all their heart followed the ways of God. So saints isn't this new term for Christian believers. And it isn't a uh, person to be venerated in the Catholic Church, Saint, they even had Saint Pilate. Well, we'll have more about Pilate in a little bit. Don't let me forget. But anyway, he's been persecuting the saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call upon your name. But the Lord said to him, go, call upon your name. So it's obviously Jesus talking to him. But the Lord said, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine. And Paul talks about being set apart from birth. And I think when each one of us is born, God starts writing a poem about us. That we are a chosen instrument of his from our birth. Um, and so, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and, son, and the sons of Israel. So three groups Paul's assigned to. We always think he just went to Gentiles, but Jesus said he's going to go to the kings. And he does. He goes, he, he's on trial with Agrippa, and he's on trial with Festus and Felix, and he's on trial with Nero in Rome, and maybe one other emperor. Um, and then also to the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my sake. See, he's already caused a lot of suffering, hasn't he? And they kind of have this thing in the Jewish, Hebrew, biblical text, measure for measure. What you measure out to others is going to be measured back to you. And sometimes it's just consequences of our stupid choices. But sometimes God allows us to suffer a little bit of what we put on other people. And Saul says, God, Jesus says, he's going to suffer for me. It's okay. 
Um, and he says, go, uh, uh, for I will show him how much he'll suffer for my sake. And Ananias departed, entered the house, and after laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you were coming, he has sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he regained his sight, and he arose and was baptized. Remember we talked about baptism after the day of Pentecost, when um, 3,000 men heard the gospel in their own language, and said, what should we do? And, and Peter said, preached a sermon, and he said, go be baptized. And we're talking about how long would it take to do traditional baptism with 3,000 people, you know? You, um, I've seen churches baptize 45 people, and it took three hours. Um, but around Jerusalem, there's all these mikvah immersion pools, and I was going to put a picture up, and I forgot, where you could go to, and you could walk down in and immerse yourself under the observation of the person that you are now having as your authority. And Saul repented, he went and immersed himself, and he came out still Jewish, but now he came out a Jewish disciple of Jesus. So I guess we could say was Paul converted, because the popular approach is, from this moment on, Paul gave up his Judaism. He's no longer a Jew, now he's a Christian Gentile. And he went to the Gentiles and proclaimed to them that Jesus gave up on the Jews and is now God, uh, that God gave up on the Jews and now wants to embrace all the Gentiles. And that, I mean, you get that if you pick a few verses out of the books later, but we want to, we want to study, that's why we're going slow here and we're getting a big picture. Because Paul continues to say he's a Pharisee. He continues, it says right here, even the title, he proclaims Jesus in the synagogues. He doesn't give up on the synagogues. He still calls himself a Pharisee. He's still going to the Jewish believers, and he's telling them that he was wrong. He missed the Jewish Messiah. He says, for the first time in my life, I see how all the scriptures were pointing to Jesus. And I see how it said that he would suffer for my iniquities. And for my sin, he'd be crushed. And he died on the cross, and he freed me from my sin. And he goes and he begins preaching to all the synagogues, all the Jewish people. And if we continue in uh, verse um, 19, and he took food and was strengthened, and now for several days he was with the disciples who were at Damascus. So for several days, but it's not like he went to Bible school for three years, and then went to seminary, and then became a pastor, he, he already recognized the Jewish Messiah predicted to come to the Jewish people. And remember, Jesus said he came to the lost sheep of Israel. They got first right of refusal. And many did refuse the good news, didn't they? And there would be 36 years from now, where we're at in this, there would be total destruction of Israel. We'll get there. We'll talk about that when we get there. So anyway, um, and uh, immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying he is the Son of God. And all those hearing him continued to be amazed and were saying, is this not he who was in Jerusalem, who destroyed those who called on his name, on this name, and who had come uh, here for the purpose of bringing them bound before the chief priests? But Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that this Jesus was the Christ, was the Messiah. And so people are going to start choosing sides. They're going to start, some Jewish people are going to say, nope, we're not going to have anything to do with this Jewish Messiah. And others are going to say, yes, this is the long promised Messiah. Well, the ones that said no are still aligned with the chief priests and the ruling class in Jerusalem, and they decide they're going to get Paul. And we're told in the next verse that when many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together to do away with him. 
But their plot became known to Saul and those who were watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall and lowering him in a basket. And then it says that he went on to Jerusalem. But what we don't realize, Paul talks about in other places in scripture, that he didn't go right away to Jerusalem. That he went for three years into Arabia. And um, that raises the question, what was he doing in Arabia? What was going on in Jerusalem and Damascus and what's Paul doing? And um, he tells us they went to Arabia for three years. Now, I did not say Saudi Arabia. There's a big difference. Because Paul says in Galatians that Mount Sinai was in Arabia. And you, you go home and Google Mount Sinai in Arabia and you will find website after website that says, Paul said the Sinai was in Saudi Arabia. You don't find that word Saudi in the Old Testament. At the time of Paul, Arabia was everything above that purple line, which is mostly part, just the Jordan River, part of Jordan, and mostly Israel, southern Israel. And there are three popular places for Mount Sinai. One is way down at the bottom of that peninsula in Egypt. One is way over in present-day Saudi Arabia. And then there's also a mountain not far from Gaza right now called Har Karkom. It's, uh, it's Mount Karkom. And it's right, fits the biblical narrative being right on the way, right not far from Kadesh Barnea, not, not far from all the places they went. Much more doable than trying to take two million people and have them travel 50 miles a day through the desert. Um, but anyway, we're not going to get off on where was Saudi Arabia, except I did want to, I did kind of want to comment a little bit on that for a minute. Um, there we go. He said in Galatians 1 that he was advancing in Judaism far above uh, his countrymen, being extremely zealous. But when he, God had set me apart, even from my mother's womb, called me through his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult flesh and blood. I just want to go back a second because the, the two most popular thoughts on where Paul went for three years is that he just kind of wandered around Damascus a little bit. He went down through Jordan and went to a place called Petra. Uh, some of you have seen that. It's where they filmed some of Indiana Jones. There's some pretty cool places there. Um, but they think he just kind of wandered around there. And then three years later, he came back to Damascus. And from Damascus, he went to Jerusalem. Um, that's the most popular view. I'm intrigued by the idea that maybe Paul went to Mount Sinai. And let's talk about that a minute. He says, um, he revealed his son to me that I might preach among the Gentiles. I didn't immediately consult with flesh and blood, other men. But nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles but I went away to Arabia, which isn't Saudi Arabia, it's Arabia, and then, and then I returned to Damascus. Three years later, I, then I went to Jerusalem and became acquainted with Cephas, or Simon, or Peter, it's all one name, and I stayed with him 15 days. So now what did Paul do for three years in Arabia? Um, he tells us in Galatians 6, I think, that Sinai is in Arabia. Um, let me see what this one is. Uh, For I delivered to you as first importance that I also receive that Christ died for our sins according to scripture. This is Paul talking. He was buried, he was raised on the third day and he, he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he so this is Literally appeared to, physically, right? After his resurrection, he was raised up. Mary Magdalene grabbed his feet or whatever. Peter saw him personally. Thomas put his hands in the hole. It says he appeared to Simon, then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. Most who remain now, but some have fallen asleep. 
And then he appeared, I think personally, to James and then to all the apostles. And then last of all, he appeared to me, one untimely born, but he appeared to me also. What I'm thinking Paul Saul is saying is he actually saw Jesus in the flesh personally. Because all these other people saw him personally. It wasn't just a vision. A lot of people can... can uh, and that's the dilemma. How can Paul be a true apostle if he didn't really see Jesus, just a vision? And so the popular thought is, well, he did see Jesus in a vision. Well, a lot of people think they saw Jesus, and a lot of people do see Jesus in a vision. But what if, what if Paul, like Moses and like Elijah, and like probably Jesus, went to Sinai? You see, Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days, and the wilderness area is really close to this other Op- option. It's near Arabia. And Jesus could have went to Sinai. Elijah went to Sinai and met with God there. Elijah was about to, to change the whole direction of ministry and anoint Elisha and, and go to heaven. And so what if Paul went and spent time with Jesus in the flesh on Sinai? I'm intrigued by that idea. And he says, I didn't, I didn't get what I know from men I got it directly from Jesus. Um, I did, uh, uh, but yeah, I didn't get it. I didn't immediately consult with flesh and blood, with people. So I think he says he went and spent three years. How long were the disciples with, and the other apostles with Jesus? So would it make sense that maybe Paul went back and said, teach me every single thing you taught the disciples? That was kind of cool. That's not the majority view, but let's, let's just put it on the table and see what we think. Okay, so um, this is a picture of Har Karkom uh, in the wilderness of Israel. And I was supposed to go there end of last summer. I was kind of trying to put it together because you take an all-day Jeep ride out through the desert, and it's not far from Gaza. And then you can climb this Mount Har Karkom, and there's some uh, artifacts that, may, that link it to Sinai, and we we're supposed to go there, and God closed the door on it. I'm kind of glad he did, because I might have been there in October. Um, but uh, there's a, it, it's very desert. This is Cheryl and I on uh, Mount Timna, which is way up in the air. It took several hours to climb. Hot, grueling trip. Um, very desert area. But the most popular place uh, for Mount Sinai is down here on this southern end of um, what they call the Sinai Peninsula, because that's tradition. That's where Constantine's mother went and said that's where Mount Sinai is. She named all these places and got them all established, and they became popular. So I wanted to go to Mount Sinai. So right up here at the top of the Gulf of Aqaba, we crossed the border into Egypt. There's quite a bit of trouble to get in because ISIS handles most of this peninsula when we were there. And we got through and we got on this bus and we started going along the Red Sea and it it used to be all resorts and now they're all boarded up because of terrorism. Nobody goes there anymore. And we got closer down towards the tip where uh, the traditional Mount Sinai is, and they put us in a bulletproof bus, transportation, with an armed guard, and in front of us was an armed escort uh, car with armed guards, and behind us was one of those Jeeps with the big machine guns that turns both ways with four soldiers in it. And they escorted us to... um, the base of Mount Sinai. And by then, it's um, mid-afternoon, and we get on these camels, and we start riding these camels into the area where you can go up Mount Sinai. And I have horrible memories of those camels. (laughs) It's not fun (laughs) to ride a camel. (laughs) And um, we, we rode those camels in, and then we started up Mount Sinai, and it's getting dark at about two-thirds of the way up. And so the rest of the way up that night is by flashlight. And we finally get to the top, 
and it starts getting so cold that we're trying to find blankets from the donkeys and the camels to stay warm. And about 4 a.m. we see these fires built and the guides are making coffee for us. And the sun starts coming up at 5 a.m. and it's such an experience to sit on Mount Sinai and watch the sun come up. And then uh, we returned. But that's... And then I get home and I find out Saul says that it's Mount Sinai is in Arabia and that wasn't even it after all that work. <laughs> that would be very difficult for two million Jewish people to get through that desert and it's a rough area and to get there. So it's not my popular choice. Um, neither is Saudi Arabia because Paul didn't say Saudi Arabia, he said Arabia. So anyway, we get back. And Saul spent three years, and he comes back to Damascus, and I think he's really preaching now. And things have gotten tense in uh, the area. Um, and people are starting to pick sides, and the persecution is getting greater and greater, and the high priest is really ramping up. And remember, um, remember a, 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 a king named Herod Antipas? And he was married to the princess of a Nabataean king, which is king of Arabia. And he met a young lady named Herodias. And she got him to marry her, but she refused to marry him unless he'd get rid of his previous wife. And in those days, divorce was frowned upon, but, it was more, but you could murder your wife. And word got out that she was in danger, and she got permission to go to Macheris, which is farther south, not far from Petra, and her daddy, King Aretas, came and got her. So she escaped. Well, in the year 35, he went to battle with King Aretas, I mean with King Antipas. And Josephus records the details, and he tells us that King Antipas is pretty cocky, and he goes to battle against, with 10,000 troops against King Aretas, who has 20,000 troops. And guess who loses? And you remember Jesus earlier told the parable, which of you, if you only had 10,000 troops, wouldn't sit down and calculate if you're going up against somebody with 20,000? He's telling this story prophetically ahead. Well, that's going on while Paul is getting back to Damascus. And Damascus is the upper end of where King Aretas is. So that's happening. And then about this time, uh, this guy, this Samaritan is saying, come meet me. And Pilate um, is still governor in Jerusalem. Caiaphas is still high priest. And they can't stand the fact that there might be another Messiah guy in Samaria. In Samaria. So they send troops down to this guy who says, I'm going to show you the temple articles. And... They send troops down, and Pilate's troops just start murdering all these people. And they take a bunch of Samaritan prisoners, and then they execute them. And then they go back to Jerusalem. And all of this is happening, and it's turmoil. And all of a sudden, they decide they don't like Paul, and so they're going to try to get him. And we, I had to look again a long time to find a young... They're all letting a 70-year-old man out over the wall in a basket in the pictures. Paul is only about 35 years old now. He's still a young man. He's still going to be live for another um, 35 years or so. He will be 70. He will be walking these roads as an old man, but not yet. Okay, and so he goes back to Jerusalem, uh, and he uh, we can we can pick up the story. And when many days had elapsed, the Jews plotted together. I'm in verse 23 to do away with him. And they, but their plot became known to Saul, and they were also watching the gates day and night so that they might put him to death. But his disciples took him by night, led him down through an opening in a wall, lowering him in a large basket. A lot of the houses were built into the walls, so they just had to find a house that had a window over. So when he came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But guess who? Barnabas took hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, that he had talked to him, and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus. 
And he was with them, moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly for the name of the Lord. And he was talking and arguing with the Jews. And, and he went on, uh, uh, he was arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were trying to put him to death. So it doesn't tell us in this chapter, but Paul relates that Jesus met him in the temple in a vision and told him to get out of Jerusalem and go back up to Tarsus, his old town. So he goes up there for quite a few years. Um, and so the church throughout Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace, being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it continued to increase. Now how could we go from all of this turmoil, from this war with Antipas and King Aretas and, how, and, and Pilate and the chief priest coming down and killing all the Samaritans and Paul trying to get arrested in Damascus and Paul trying to get arrested in Jerusalem and then all of a sudden we have peace. Well, thank you, Josephus. Josephus says that Caesar heard about Pilate and how he slaughtered the Samaritans and he recalled Pilate to Rome, exiled him to some far off country sent a guy named Vitilius to be the new governor. Vitilius shows up in Jerusalem, and the first thing he does is he kicks Caiaphas out and appoints his own high priest. And they have peace in Jerusalem. Because all of a sudden, the Sadducees don't have a high priest that's, that's part of the mafia. Now, unfortunately, Annas and Caiaphas and the brothers find a way to get back in later. But for right now, we have peace and allows the church to grow and prosper. We have, so, so far, just recap, we have a lot of people that were in Jerusalem for the, and we'll finish with this, a lot of people were in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost, and they went out to at least 15 different countries. Jewish people going back to their Jewish communities, to their Jewish synagogues, proclaiming Jesus as Lord. Then we have uh, Philip going to Samaria, and the Samaritans, the Jewish um, Israelite Samaritans who still speak Hebrew coming to know the Lord. Then God says, Philip, go to the desert road towards Ethiopia, and he encounters the Ethiopian eunuch. That word actually is poorly translated into Greek. It's often used for a steward. Uh, uh, he's, he's like the queen's right-hand man. He's in charge of everything. He's got a scroll that are very expensive. He's reading Hebrew. He's reading out of Isaiah. Philip gets in the chariot, tells him what he's reading about Jesus. He gets baptized and he goes on his way to, way, I don't have the map, but Ethiopia was considered as far east as the, as the earth went. So the gospel has gone out to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and now it's starting to the ends of the earth. It went out to Ethiopia. Paul goes up north to Damascus. So now we've gone, I mean south, south to Ethiopia. So we've covered south, we're covering north, all around Damascus area. He, he spends his time uh, on the uh, east side, and now uh, he, he, he is told in a vision to go back to Caesarea and go back to Tarsus. He's going to get ready to go to the west. So the gospel is going out, but it's still Jewish believers for the most part. Next week, we're going to inter get introduced to Peter. Again, Peter gets back in the story, and he is going to be confronted with the idea of Gentiles becoming Christians. <clears throat> because all the Jewish leadership is saying, no, they have to convert to Judaism, be circumcised, and become Jews, and then they can become Christians. So just like Peter had to decide in Samaria, can these guys be Christians? He's going to have to make a decision about Gentiles. And so that's where we're moving. So you see, we're already into this maybe seven, eight years, and still no Gentile Christians. Still, Jesus is desiring that those Jews who heard the message will come to him. And then as a result of that, it's going to go out into all the world and and because of Paul, largely, what if, what, if, what if Ananias would have said, no, I'm not going to go to Paul? And Paul wasn't healed, and Paul didn't go to the Gentiles. So I think about this. We'll close with this. I don't know if Saul was converted. It's not like he left the Protestant church and became a Catholic um, or something like that. He saw he was a Jewish devout Jewish student who saw the Jewish Messiah, 
Um, but he definitely obtained salvation that day, didn't he? And it tells us that he saw a bright light. He had eyes. He encountered the Lord with his eyes. It says that he heard the voice of the Messiah speaking to him. He had ears to hear. He had a heart to understand. He repented. He um, was baptized. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he took time to study and be discipled. And then he went to share the good news and to be a witness. A witness tells what they've experienced. So isn't this kind of a, a cool salvation step here? Isn't this kind of what we've all gone through in different ways? Scripture says that we have to have eyes to hear, ears to hear, and hearts to understand. And Isaiah said, the people that won't follow God will keep on closing their eyes, covering their ears like monkey see, monkey do, and, and hardening their hearts. At some point in time, everybody here has had ears to hear, eyes to see the Jewish Messiah, a heart to understand that his message went out to all people of all nationalities, of all tribes, of all denominations. He asks us to turn from our sins. Moses, the first redeemer, freed the people from slavery to Egypt. Jesus, this final redeemer, freed the people from slavery to sin. And that's what he came and did for us. And, and repentance occurred, and at some point then, baptism, he, Saul went in that water as a religious um, Pharisee who didn't believe in the Messiah and came out of that water as a Christian uh, Jewish believer who did recognize the Jewish Messiah. And then he studied and was discipled, and then he began sharing. So that's our goal this week. There is nobody that you can't talk to at Christmas time. You realize that? You go into a store, anywhere, and you can just say, Merry Christmas. Uh, you can just say, isn't this a great time of year? Isn't it amazing that God sent his son as a gift to us? That's the best gift of all. And so it's a great time. Um, peace. Those three girls, the, the Christian, the Jewish, and the Muslim girl, are willing to lay their life down for peace. And to have a Christian be able to wear a cross in the Jewish army even five years ago was unheard of. Um, and yet, I'm reading many, many reports of Christian, Jewish Christians serving um, with the Israel army right now. I read the last chapter of the last book, and we do win. <laughs> But isn't it fun to begin to understand the disciples and Saul? His name is still Saul. Paul means little or less significance. I think Saul came to a point where he wanted his name to be Paul. We'll talk about that. It was common to have a Greek name. But he wanted to go from, he wanted, he wanted the verse in John, he must increase, I must decrease. I think that needs to be all of our prayers. How can I be smaller in the eyes of the world and greater in the eyes of God as I be a witness and go? So go this week, proclaim the good news that we were slaves, we've been redeemed, um, and he wins, and we get to go to a wedding supper, and our groom is coming back, and it's going to be glorious in the world to come. Lord, thank you so much for your word today. Thank you for taking us back into time and history, making uh, some pieces fall in place. Lord, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for peace in Israel. We pray for the return of your son to take us all uh, to his home, to uh, be our king, to be our groom, to be uh, our leader in the world to come. And we await those days eagerly. And in the meantime, we're happy to be a witness and if need be, be a martyr. But we love you. We recognize you as that long-promised Jewish Messiah who gave his life to die for each of us. And uh, we ask you to fill us with your Holy Spirit this week and give us words to say everywhere we go to be salt and light. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>